Hey folks, welcome to Roll of Law. Sometimes people ask, how does being a lawyer affect your gaming? And often the answer is not much. I might think a little bit more about legal systems or justice systems when I'm doing my world building, but it doesn't usually come up that often. Typically, adventurers are acting outside the law. Now, an exception, and this is something I've done a few times, is that I've decided to sue my characters. Or rather, I've had my characters, when I'm DMing, sued by an NPC. So I thought I'd talk about one that I've run actually a few times because I'm a big believer in recycling stuff. Um, waste not, want not, and you can really save a lot of time as a DM if you have a good sort of back catalog of material that you can go back to. But let's have a look at this and I'll talk a little bit about this lawsuit and a bit about sort of how I changed it from real world experiences to make it a little bit more fun and interesting and how this can be done in a game. So let's bring this up here because I've got a statement of claim. And so it's got a court file number. Uh, in the real world, they'd assign a file, a file number just so that they can track it. So I put that in there. It's not really something that's going to affect the game. Court, Royal Court of Pergamon, Judicial District of Mon Barisal. So that tells us where this is happening, the kingdom and the city. Plaintiffs, Mervyn Cassell. So that's who's suing. And I blocked out the defendants because that's other people's characters' names here, and I don't think that they uh, that that needs to be shared. So, statement of claim, and I put this in a really obnoxious font. I hope you guys can read it, but I'll read it out as we go. Um, Please take notice that you are being sued and are therefore a defendant in this manner. Now, this is text that you would find in a lawsuit here where I am, which is Alberta, Canada, and this is actually really useful both for the real world and for a game because in the real world you want this so that people understand what's going on and in the game same thing i want the players to 100 percent understand what's happening so the plaintiff is represented by bolton bulldog coldwell of coldwell and associates the address for service of documents is number 16 uh, c silverleaf road now This is also something that you would find in a real world statement of claim, although you probably wouldn't put the nickname in there. I'm throwing the nickname in there just to kind of, even before they've met this, this lawyer, they've already got an idea of who this person might be and what they might be like. So I'm trying to spin that up a little bit before they even meet this person. Um, The address for service of documents, again, you'd find that in most legal filings, but here it also is an adventure hook. Now this is a place where the player characters can decide to go check this out. They might go and visit this lawyer and try to talk to them. So, and that's just purely optional. They can do that or not as they wish. Uh, Statement of facts relied upon. So this is where this sort of lawsuit lives. This is what's going on. So the plaintiff, Mervyn Cassell, is the son of Franz Cassell. At all material times, he has been a resident of Mon Barisal. So that tells us a little bit of background. And usually in a lawsuit, a statement of claim is broken up into these kinds of short paragraphs. I've made them maybe a little shorter than they might otherwise be because a real statement of claim might be like 30 pages and nobody wants that as part of their D&D experience. Certainly I don't. Um, Drafting a full statement of claim is not a whole lot of fun. Um, I mean, it's not the worst legal task, but it's still not something that I really want to spend a lot of time on in my prep. I want to have something short and punchy so that people know what's going on and I can spin this into adventure, right? So Franz Cassell was the lawful owner of Cassell Manor up until he went missing. He's currently believed to be dead as no sign have been heard of him in many years. So now we've got a bit of a mystery here, right? Now Cassell Manor is at this point, it's a, a house that was gifted to the players. And why, why was it gifted to the players? Well, recognition of their prior accomplishments. Also because the local monarch kind of wants to pin them down and say, hey, you guys live here and you know you have a connection to this place because you guys are actually being really useful heroes. Let's tie you to, to my kingdom so that that way you can have a, uh, you know, some sort of connection here and maybe you'll help out my land this is savvy, uh, savvy rulership from the monarch. 
now you know once that's happened now they're now i'm going to make mysteries about it now i'm going to make uh, adventure that is connected to it so this claim to cassell manor has never been ceded nor has it been lawfully forfeited or otherwise abrogated cancelled or annulled so he's claiming i still own cassell manor the plaintiff is the only surviving heir of franz cassell accordingly the plaintiff is the lawful owner of cassell manor which means, hey, you guys are in my house, right? So that's the dispute. And hopefully at this point, you've got players who are kind of attached to it. That's, that's the hope. The defendants were given permission to occupy Cassell Manor by Her Majesty Queen Alaria III. However, she lacked the authority to grant this permission, given that the land was lawfully owned by the plaintiff. Now, already this is kind of establishing a monarchy with limits, because in some kingdoms where the monarch's power might be more uh, more plenary, the, the queen might have been able to just say, anybody's house, I can just dictate who it belongs to. But here we're seeing a system that is a little more legalistic in the sense of a little more, uh, there are restrictions on the queen's power. So that's already telling us something about the justice system, although quite honestly... I think that probably the only person who really worries about that is me, the law geek at the table. But um, it does tell us that there is um, sort of a, I'm basically closing off that avenue that the players might otherwise have used to try to drive them towards the more interesting parts, the interesting adventure aspects. Uh, Her Majesty Queen Ilaria III is immune to lawsuit by sovereign privilege. So based on that, she can't sue. Now, I have thrown, I threw some typos into this on purpose. Uh, most legal filings include a bunch, but um, yeah, there's a few here and there, and uh, I'm, I've just sort of noticed them and went, oh right, I did do that on purpose. But uh, yeah, there's one up a little further where there was uh, at all materials times. That was just stylistic. That's, you don't need to do that. At the time when it was occupied unlawfully by the defendants, Cassell Manor contained furniture, goods, and other valuable items belonging to the plaintiffs. Uh, these items have been damaged, disposed of, or destroyed, either by the hands of the defendants or at their direction. Now, this is true in the sense that there were things in the manor. However, when the players moved into the manor, it was full of junk. It was full of garbage, um, furniture that had been, you know, chewed to bits by rats, um, stuff that was just ruined. So yeah, it all got thrown out because it was all trash and the place needed some fixing up. So now this guy, this plaintiff is saying, hey, this was all my nice stuff. Where, what did you do with it? And now we're getting into a bit of place of tension, right? The players aren't going to be happy about this. And this is a place where you want to have built up a bit of trust with your players, ideally. Um, and, you know, this has gone over uh, better and worse with different groups. And really the thing is, is have you built up some trust with your players is really, I think, the, uh, the guiding force on this. Because this is a bad thing happening to the players. And so you want them to have some trust and some ability to... Um, uh, to basically say, yes, this is going to turn into something fun later on. Um, and, you know, I haven't always been the most successful at that. So that's just something to gauge. Make sure you're at that place before you do something like this. All right. Defendants either had actual knowledge that they were not the lawful owners of the property and its contents, or they were reckless as to that fact. So this is basically saying either you knew that this wasn't yours or you should have known that this wasn't yours. Now, given that the players were given this by the ruler, um, you'd think that they would say, hey, um, no, this is a, a place where they might want to, to argue that point. So as a result of these actions, plaintiff has suffered losses, including the occupation of his ancestral home without rent and the destruction of his family's property, much of which consists of irreplaceable heirlooms. Plaintiff seeks damages in the amount of 50,000 gold pieces for the damaged property, along with rent as determined by the courts, payable to the date of first occupation, along with punitive and such other special damages as may be awarded by the court. 
So here we've got, this is what you'll often see in a lawsuit is, I want money and I'm going to pick some big numbers, big numbers, which are scary numbers. And, you know, this is some motivation because at the time that I've run this, none of the groups have had anywhere close to 50,000 gold pieces. And quite frankly, if they did, I would increase that number because the, the point of this is that the player shouldn't be going, oh yeah, we'll just pay this off. Uh, that's not really what I was going for with this. Uh, I'm looking for a situation where they're going, oh, we got to take this seriously. This is a bad thing happening. Uh, this amount is being claimed jointly and severally against all defendants. So what that means is that they can claim this amount in any amount from each of the player characters. Uh, this also means that you can't have one person who's like, well, I've dropped my character, so now the amount that they can sue for is less. It's like, no, no, they can still come after you guys. Um, I mean, that's this is something that you would find in a real lawsuit, but it also is useful in a D&D &D group. So why not include that? Plaintiff seeks costs against defendants for all expenses incurred and inherent to the bringing of this action, including solicitor and own client costs. So I want you to pay for my lawyer, is what that means. This matter is to be spoken to before a magistrate of the Court of Moran Barisal on Market Day, the third day of the month of coins in the year 583. Uh, I'm a big believer in setting up a calendar for whatever setting you're using. Um, it allows you to do a lot of different things and you can play around with it. But here it's setting a specific court date uh, for this to be addressed. Take notice that if you fail to attend or have a representative attend on your behalf, hint, hint, you can hire a lawyer is kind of a hint on this one. Um, along with a properly filed and served statement of defense by that date, you may have a judgment entered against you in default. So you got to do something. You're getting sued. There's a time limit on this one. You got to act. And take notice that all contact between plaintiff and defendants is to occur through the plaintiff's barrister and solicitor as enumerated above, which means don't you bunch of scary adventurers, please don't go talk directly to the person suing you, which is itself kind of a hint because the players might not decide to do that. They might actually go and say, you know what, we're going to ignore that and we're going to talk directly to this person. Um, it's a hint about a way they could do things badly that will have some potential consequences but which might also be fun, right? There's the potential for fun here. Now, what is going on with this? Well, the players are going to want to know, right? Because there's going to be questions about what's happening. Where did Franz Cassell go? What happened to him? Because, you know, and why is the queen giving us this if it's not something that is, you know, open for purchase? There's all of these things that require some investigation. And this is the pot, this drives the possibility of all sorts of adventures. Uh, maybe the players want to negotiate in some fashion with Mervyn Cassell. Maybe he's willing to take something else um, as, you know, repayment. Maybe there's something he really wants, you know, a magic item out there that the players could quest for and, you know, enter into a judge, like they could settle this out for a particular item. Uh, maybe there's some other way they could resolve this. I mean, Depending on your group, they might just go and try to murder Mervyn Cassell. Solves your lawsuit. Might cause other problems, but solves your lawsuit. Um, this is not real-world legal advice, by the way. Things that make sense in a D&D campaign really often don't work well in uh, in the real world. But um, especially because when you think about it, most D&D &D characters are by their nature kind of criminals. They go and break into people's houses and murder them and steal their stuff all of which is bad ideas in the real world. Um, they can go and try to investigate these details. Um, if they choose to hire a lawyer, that gives you another NPC that you can inject in and, you know, a way to sort of play things up. And then that lawyer can give them suggestions. So if they don't have ideas on their own of how they want to do this, then they can go and investigate it. Now, as I've mentioned, I've run this multiple times because I'm a, a consummate pack rat in terms of my uh, my D and D stuff. I'm a big believer that um, reusing things makes sense. Now, sometimes this has worked really well. I've had groups that have said, "All right," and they dive into this and they start investigating and they start trying to uh, deal with this, or you know, in various different ways. 
And I've had groups where it fell flat. And when it falls flat, it tends to fall flat badly. Because, you know, if people feel that this is an attack on them, then that can be, um, that can be a problem. So this is a place to gauge your group and how they're going to react to that. Um, lots of D and D players don't like it when bad things happen to their characters. They want to be sort of adventurers that might experience setbacks in the sense of like the villain got away, but not so much setbacks in terms of like, you know, somebody burned down their house or, you know, somebody went after one of their family members. You can often kind of gauge this from how people write their backgrounds. Because when people write a background that is sort of um, what I'd call a defensive framing to a background, where they've systematically killed off or alienated everyone in their background, um, then they're probably not looking for that kind of experience. If somebody's got an ex you know a background where they've got all sorts of friends and family and so forth, usually they're a little more inviting into you know, hey, you can cause some trouble for me in these fashions. Whereas somebody's background is basically Batman, you know, where they have oh, their family is dead, you know, everyone they know gets killed. And, you know, usually people write this as like Batman minus Alfred. So they've got just nobody. They're this super loner. And in that circumstance, they're probably not going to enjoy that, you know, this kind of thing. If you're unsure, I mean, you can talk to your players. This is a good thing to talk about in session zero. You know, how do you feel about the DM using things from your background or, you know, causing you difficulties and those kinds of things, throwing up roadblocks. Um, some people want a different experience than others. And that's an important thing. Um, the other thing is that part of being a DM is getting stuff wrong. Um, it's going to happen and you roll with it as best you can. So I've had this work really well. I've had situations where it didn't work as well. It's something you might want to consider, like just something to consider trying. Now, I don't recommend trying to make the experience of being sued in a game directly parallel with the experience of being sued in real life, because in real life, it sucks. It sucks real bad. Um, including for the lawyers. I mean, nobody has fun really in a, a civil suit. Nobody really enjoys it. And typically everyone comes out feeling worse by the end of it. That's not what you want for this kind of thing. You want it to be a springboard into adventure. You want it to be a springboard into something that where you can solve things. So give your players meaningful things that they can do to advance their claim. You know, maybe there's a, you know, some dark secret about Franz Cassell that if you discover it might break his claim to this. And then the players can go on an adventure to maybe some ruined, you know, maybe Franz Cassell had a summer uh, house and you could go and raid that. Maybe it's full of undead and demons and whatever else. And then that gives the players a positive thing that they can do, a step that they can meaningfully take to solve this. And then they can come back with, you know, some piece of evidence. That evidence is now treasure, right? And that treasure is worth quite a bit because this lawsuit is 50,000 gold coins and up. So this is one thing, you know, that I really caution. This shouldn't be a paper battle. If you find yourself spending too much time with like paper going back and forth, no, this should really be something that is, you've got to find ways to hook this in to adventures in some fashion. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to share that because I've had a few sort of comments going, hey, uh, you know, why is this role of law? What What's that about? And I am a lawyer and both a lawyer and a massive geek. So sometimes those two things can intersect in fun ways. Um, I kind of like this. I will do this again. Absolutely, I will. So I thought I would share it with you and share the story and a bit of my thoughts on it. So thank you for joining me. Hope to see you next time.